Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the What Virtual Communities Teach Us About Humanity session. I'm Matthew Donegan Ryan from Swapcard. Uh, we're the company that actually builds the, the virtual platform that all, uh, all of you are using today. Uh, we're joined on this uh, session with our panelist, Jessica Duarte from uh, the National Association of Music Merchants and Narissa Wild uh, from Informa Market. So Jessica, why don't you tell us how you adapted your audience to a virtual community from your in-person event? Um, so luckily our in-person event is already about community. So we were either you know, able to take that information and kind of switch it into um, a virtual mode um, by marketing to all of our communities that we already have. And since it's music, um, there is a large music community and then there's communities inside of that. So we have a very strong base of uh, music teachers and students, for example. So we have a group of people that reaches out to that group and says, you know, we can't see you in person, but we'd love to see you online. We're going to have plenty of content for you. And then our core membership, which is uh, manufacturers and retailers of musical products, those communities, it's like, you know, swap card, you'll be able to show a virtual booth. And then for our members, you'll be able to see virtual sessions. Um, and then, you know, kind of talking about the chat and the interaction to kind of, you know, mimic the communities that we have at a live event um, virtually. And, and Nurse, what about you? I know you manage a large number of events. Um, how are you able to shift that audience to virtual from, from in person? I think, uh, Matthew, that 2020 was really the year of trying to understand what we are trying to do with our virtual events. And what we came to discover quickly is that it's really important to define how a virtual event is different and complements the in-person rather than trying to replicate it. Um, and so we saw that, you know, to test and trial 2020, lots of things went really well, some things really didn't go that well. And it was really governed around in a digital economy, in a digital space, how do we as, as um, consumers of this, this content behave differently? And so it was using a lot of the data and insights that are very rich coming from swap card to help us identify that when we thought, you know, like product discovery or networking or uh, features such as creating spaces for people to gather and bump into each other. You know, those happened um, Those happened successfully in some places and not so much in others. So it was really understanding for those communities, actually, as Jessica was saying, what is it that they're trying to do that they can accomplish in a digital environment that is potentially different and complementary to the live event? So it's really using the data and insights and talking to customers around our customer validation and research to truly understand what can we offer you that actually is rich and powerful and a little bit different um, so as not to replace the live event. And that was a big learning for us that, that we still continue to learn from. But the data and insights and the richness of um, data we get from Swapcard is very foundational in helping us create those user journeys and experiences. Yeah, and I'd love to I'd love to dive a little deeper on kind of the the uh, information you get back uh, regarding people viewing the content. But before we do that, maybe let's let's stick to this networking. You mentioned you know people are networking differently. So uh, obviously at your in person events, you have all these networking receptions with great food and drinks and entertainment. Um, I know you also have like scheduled meetings. When that when that shifted on online. Uh, you know, the channel changes, but how, how did that affect your, the networking uh, among the attendees? So, yeah, so for us, you know, what we found is in some of our um, portfolios, it increased networking capabilities actually by trifold and sometimes quadfold, you know, because it it's a behavior that maybe in a real life environment, people are scared or it's, a bit overwhelming um, and also you know it's it's kind of embarrassing for a lot of people to just walk up to somebody and say hey you know want to grab coffee and talk about this whereas in a more anonymous environment which the web provides you know people are a bit more 
audacious, I would say. They're braver, you know, they want to reach out and connect. So we see a lot more bravery. I think that's a quality of being virtual. Um, it's not as intimidating. And that's important, right, to tap into that, uh, those facets of human behavior around these activities. And the second point around networking is really the role that we play as curators, as orchestrators to facilitate that networking, right? And using the data and insights coming from a swap card through the AI matchmaking, but also the knowledge we have of the industry, there is an element of threading human curation into um, what is, you know, done through our in, the intelligence of the data and having subject matter experts in the platform to help orchestrate that. And I think that has been really fundamentally important to us to create more networking opportunities um, that may not always seem obvious, but they're always there. That element of serendipity in networking is a lot harder to do digitally than it is in real life. I think it's all about finding that balance, like the familiar and what you're comfortable with networking receptions, but then the new with technology, like you don't go to a networking session and have a bubble over your head saying, you know, what company you work for. It's like, you know, looking at people's badges that shows, but, you know, with swap card, you can go to meet attendees and search for companies and kind of like know about that person ahead of time, which is very familiar to people as well because of the way we search other social media platforms, you know, like on LinkedIn, we're looking for this certain group of people and it kind of emboldens you a little bit because you already know you have something in common with that person. Um, the other thing that I find great is encouraging people who are in sessions that are chatting with each other to take it to the next level and say like, oh, I attended that session, I learned this, what did you get out of it? So, you know, we're hoping in the future to kind of grow that a little bit more so there's a mix because at a live show, everyone's in a session room or everyone is, you know, in one physical place. So this just gives you more opportunity, but you definitely have to nurture it um, on, the, on the planner side and really let people know and give them the information that they need in order to, kind of get to those connections and, and assist them with that. Because um, I think people are probably, you know, equally as shy just reaching out and sending a connection request. <laughs> so um, I totally forgot my point on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it, it's kind of interesting because if you, if you think about at live events, um, you know, if you can go back to what Nurse said, there's a lot of people are you know, more introverted, especially if it's a new industry for them or a new event that they're attending, it's it's hard for them to, you know, like nurses to just walk up and, and meet someone. Did did you find that offering these meetings online helped with help with those people who maybe were a little bit more shy about, uh, you know, running into someone and just having an impromptu uh, networking meeting with them? Uh, definitely. I think, you know, where we're trying to really button up is in almost, um, combining um, the element of letting people discover, overlaying that curation and human um, nudging, if you will, to support the networking. And then there's the element for our sponsors um, and exhibitors to really ensure that those meetings happen. Actually, it's on the buy and the sell side for us in formal markets and what role we play in ensuring that the meetings happen, right? So connections, sought after connections made and then meetings um, scheduled and meetings taking place you know that's the conversion funnel for us and that's where we drive the quality for those buyer seller relationships and the connections so we're looking at ways that we can really um, reinforce and as I said you know what's the golden nudge um, to ensure that the meetings happen yeah also with the networking we tried to get exhibitors to use the contact scoring and lead lead scores. So that way they could follow up either the same day or the day after with those that were, you know, highly qualified leads and using the tags and notes to kind of center in on the folks that they should meet. And one of the interesting things we're seeing in the data now is some of the smaller level um, exhibitors really took advantage of that and made like a thousand, you know, contacts, right? So they now have that information. So after the show, they can go back and if they didn't secure a meeting during the event, they can actually still message them now and, and set up meetings as well. 
Yeah, I know, but you know, both of you with your communities, you're, you support the communities through sponsors, exhibitors, these these companies that traditionally would buy a, a trade show booth. So, you know, uh, I can see how offering all these networking opportunities for them and then tracking the number of leads that they're getting, it makes it a lot easier for them to, to show their ROI when they're deciding if they're going to, you know, renew their sponsorship for future years. Um, I, I wanted to do, expand a little bit on the accessibility topic, you know, to dip, Traditionally, when we think of in-person events, uh, there is an accessibility issue. You know, there's people that either, um, you know, aren't, aren't able to attend, you know, multi-day events, stand up, walk a trade show floor for hours, go to networking receptions. There's also the access issue of some people can't afford to, you know, fly and pay for a hotel for an event. Um, so by shifting your community online, you, you open it up to more people. So did you, did you find that your audience kind of re remain the same group of people? Um, did you see some contraction in some areas and expansion in others? I'd, I'd be curious, um, maybe Jessica, if you want to touch on that first. Yeah, um, one of the biggest uh, increases we saw was in international traffic. So we are a global show, um, but the amount um, increased, I believe it was from something like 20% to 35% of our registrants um, were international. And that was just great. Luckily, you know, we were able to supply content to that community as well. So we had lots of international content to support that group. And then, you know, the fact that the site is open 24 hours a day allows everyone an opportunity. You know, I always say like, oh, well, this is outside of normal show hours. And, you know, so like the lights are off, the hall is closed, but there's plenty of action still going on depending um, where you were at in the world. And the other thing that's wonderful for us for expanding the audience is a lot of our, you know, retail members or, or business members aren't able to bring their whole staff because of cost, you know, and coming to Anaheim, you know, California is costly. So they were able to have their team sign on and um, watch sessions and network with each other and see all the new products um, and brand pages and anytime that they want. And we're actually, um, our site's gonna stay open for the month after the event. So we're kind of giving an extended time and, you know, watching, exhibitors get happier and happier because their brand pages are being you know seen their content is being watched and then same with the nam side um our events are being replayed and by groups of people that either were too busy the week of during the virtual event and now they're just discovering it or again they're telling their staff and their friends and their customers to come and and watch content as well yeah, there, there's so many ways to, to reuse the content. Uh, Narissa, I'd be, I'd be curious how your audience has, has changed, you know, which, which groups have maybe shrunk a little bit, which groups have gotten larger? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think addressing your question, or your piece around it, accessibility, um, we definitely have seen um, a rise in new audience segments. So similar to Jessica, international has definitely grown. For some of our events, actually, we saw over 80% new attendee sign up uh, for the virtual events, which you know obviously is huge. I think we've also tried to govern a few of our sustainability um, guidelines within our toolkit. So you know, Informa has a, a very strong sustainability program, and using this opportunity through virtual events to showcase some of our sustainable actions, right? Obviously through carbon emissions and saving um, because people are traveling less, thinking about as well um, the use of plastic, reusable materials, all of the elements that we benefit from through virtual activity uh, versus in person. And, you know, it's a fine balance, right? Because you don't want one to offset the other and suddenly it to seem like in person is a terrible thing. But at the same time, you know, there are benefits that we do need to showcase and actually help and then i think on the on the equity right around cost and availability to travel for our entrepreneurial community where you know money's tight they're doing about 15 different jobs from you know product r d all the way through to product branding um, and trying to get their products on the shelves there we see um, a rise in, in um, attendance as well in that entrepreneurial community, irrespective of the of the vertical industries, whether that's finished goods, um, engineering, 
supply ingredients for su supplements, you know, the rise in entrepreneurial communities has been pretty uh, staggering and exciting, right? Because that's a whole generation of new customers for us. Um, I think when you start to look at your audience segments by demographics, right? So that's a really interesting way to segment too. And no surprises, millennials, Gen Zs, you know, they're very much at the forefront of embracing virtual, but on the flip side, they're very much at the forefront of saying, you know, no more internet. So there, you know, there's some interesting patterns that we're seeing. It's just, you know, finding time and energy to unpack all of those insights, right? And, and then what do you do with it? But we're seeing patterns um, in demographics, in new audiences, in new segments. Um, R&D has also been a growing segment for us across our different communities, because I think there are much more, um, you know, just a quiet, group of people, they're a lot more reserved. So as we were talking about before, this is a, a an easier path for them to network and engage and, and scour without necessarily being seen. Um, so there's a, a bit more anonymity there. And then, you know, sometimes in our CEO community, they also don't want to be seen or bothered as much. And so they can um, be a part of the experience and, and just decide how engaged they, they truly want to be, which I think is a benefit as well. Yeah, to, uh, Nurse, the two things that you, that you said that I hadn't really thought about uh, is the sustainability aspect. You know, if, instead of having 10,000 people, you know, fly to your event, buy hotels, you know, booking Ubers. And, um, you know, if we look at, you know, this event, South by Southwest in, in Austin, um, people are traveling from all over the world to attend. And that's, that has a massive, uh, you know, carbon footprint. So, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's another, <laughs> another reason it makes sense to, to meet virtually. And then when you mentioned about the younger audience, um, Nurse, I'm not sure about your, your events in particular. Um, a lot of my clients are associations who plan you know, big annual trade shows, probably more similar to Jessica's events. And all of the associations, I don't know a single one of them that isn't trying to attract a lower audience. You know, association membership average age increases every year. I don't know if that's similar to yours. Um, but yeah, Jessica, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. You know, is, is lowering you know, the average age of, of your members a goal and has having a virtual audience uh, affected that? I mean, that's always something that you think about, right? Like who's gonna who's gonna be the next generation? Like we we have a, a NAM YP, NAM Young Professionals, you know, definitely trying to think about that that next group coming in. And I think that that speaks back to, you know, owners being able to bring their staff. Um, because of all the professional development that we offer during during our shows, all of the education and training, it's very important that the staff, you know, get that information so that they can grow um, their businesses and, you know, maybe, you know, work on their manager skills or marketing. We have lots of marketing sessions. So we got to finally talk about, you know, using TikTok for the music industry um, when you're a retailer and all of these newer ideas that maybe the older members aren't quite, you know, ready to jump into like oh, another platform, but then, you know, younger, fresh using TikTok are like, no, we need to know more information about it. You know, this is reaching millions and millions of people. Um, so I think it's just, it's kind of breaking down the barrier of just getting to the show. It's, it's just letting people, you know, access it more freely. And, and hopefully that opens up the age groups as well. Yeah, definitely. And um, both of you mentioned uh, an international audience for some of your events. So I know for um, for your events, typically they're hosted in one city and one country and everyone travels there. When you meet virtually, I'm curious uh, how you change your schedule. Did you did you still make people kind of wake up in the middle of the night if they're in another uh, another part of the world? Or did you repeat content um, in you know several time zones? And if you repeated it, was it pre-recorded or live. So maybe Jessica, if you could start us off and, and tell us how you handle the international audience. Yeah. So one of our, our marquee events was Believe TV. So we had like a channel and we did replay the content, but replaced um, certain sections that maybe we only had, um, you know, license to play one time with international content and focusing on artists like music artists um, from around the world that were important to that, you know, general area. Another um, marquee event we did was global live stream where we had an entire day of music from around the world. And it was live streamed and basically one artist would pass the mic off to another artist. 
And this was just something amazing, a one-time thing, but anywhere you were in the world, you could turn it on and there would be something, you know, going for that time slot. Um, as far as the meetings, we definitely had a lot of discussions in, um, internally about when to offer meetings. And, and in order to be, you know, inclusive to everybody, we ended up giving 24 hours of meeting slots to all attendees. So exhibitors had meetings kind of a, you know, seven to seven Pacific time, but if they did need to use meeting slots to meet um, internationally, they could always use their, you know, their personal meeting slots or more of their attendee slots for that. So wanted to make sure that everyone was covered, but, you know, it is a little bit to take some people aback when they see like, wait, I can meet with someone at 12 a.m. And I was like, well, it's 12 a.m. to you, but it's 4 p.m. somewhere else. So um, yeah, and one thing that's great about Swap Card, and we had to keep reminding people is you're viewing it in your time zone. So it is personalized to you. So when you're setting a meeting, you don't have to do all the, the guesswork um, in there, finding out when you're available. So that's kind of the two ways we, we extended the international was through the meetings and then through content again. Yeah, there's so what, what about you? How did you handle the, the international audience from a time zone perspective? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and the biggest um, event that we've had, funnily enough, was an internal event that we've just done called IMX Live, where we had our whole division participating. So, um, Matthew, you were involved in that too as a speaker. And so we have, you know, 5,000 global colleagues across, you know, across the world. What we did was to create, um, we created a session agenda by region. So we had one for um, China, one for the rest of Asia, one for America, and one for Europe, Middle East, and, and Africa. And then we, we kind of um, med muddled in pre-recorded pre sessions with some live sessions. So keynotes came from... The, the presidents or the leads from that region, right? So they're in that time zone so they could present those live. Obviously, we would record them so that they would be available afterwards on demand as well. And then any of the sessions we were trying to pull in from different um, locations, whether they were recorded in the Middle East or in the US, we would pre-record so that we could um, play those across the different uh, tracks. So whether, so you think about, your track based on your locale and not uh, so much on searching for content. And so there was a lot of duplication or triplication of the session so that there wasn't anything you would miss out on. Um, anything that we felt was a global view, we would, we would place that um, session specifically in each of the agendas um, in the relevant time zone. So that way, you know, there were some things that we didn't do perfectly. You know, it's, it's actually really hard to do. Um, but we learned a lot and it was a, a good start for us to understand managing these multiple time zones, you know, and, and as Jessica said, Swap Card does a good job of localizing it to where you are, but also um, allowing us to stream it in different ways. So, you know, if we had the same piece of content, we could use a Vimeo stream, a YouTube stream. Um, so if the, the two were streaming at the same time, you know, that way they wouldn't clash with each agenda track. Um, so that was important to. Yeah, one uh, one thing that um, some of our clients do is like you, they have, you know, maybe two or three different time zones or, you know, they have the North America, the, um, you know, EMEA and, and uh, time zones. Uh, what they have sometimes done is they've, you know, broadcast the content for those regions live. They've rebroadcast it as a recording later, but they've asked the speaker to come back and do the Q&A live. So you don't need to ask your speakers to, hey, do your 45 minute session three times. It's, it's like do your you know, 30 minutes of content once and then 10 minutes of Q&A three times. And, and we found that to be pretty valuable. Um, Nurse, I wanna go back to you. Speaking of content, uh, at the start, you were telling us about the, the metrics and the data that you get from your attendees when they view your content online. Um, that's maybe a little bit uh, easier to digest than, and, and more comprehensive than the data you get from the in-person um, viewers of, of sessions. So can you expand on that? Tell us what you track, why it's valuable to track and how that impacts your, your business decisions? Yeah, of course. So, you know, for us, content is, is everything, right? You know, it's 
brochure downloads, it's views of videos, um, and then it's more traditional in the sense of education, thought leadership, content tracks that you have within the um, offering itself. And, you know, in a live event, we can see if someone enters a room, because typically the, ba the badge will be scanned, but if they leave or if they fall asleep, it's very hard to know, right? Whereas in digital, in this space, when, when you know, to your point, when it's pre-recorded in particular, the speakers or the panel, depending on the session type, can be very active in the chat and, and actually engaging the audience, right, through polls, through asking questions themselves, um, through engaging in responses and Q&A and being very active. So you can see the level of participation and, and you can, you know, pull that data out and really look at who was asking what and what keywords are trending, which information people are asking about most frequently. You can do that analysis just with the chat content itself. And it's extremely rich. And, you know, I can't recall every conversation that's happening in, in a session room. Um, so that, so we've started to think about even in live, when we have live sessions, you know, the digital components we pull in to create that engagement, like having, um, live interaction polls, Q&A, quizzes, uh, ways to make sure that the audience is actively listening and not just passively participating. That's a really key piece for us. Um, and then the other thing I would say on the on the metrics is, you know, we work with, with preferred partners um, with swap card like Balladar is a good example where we've integrated with them. And so we can start to see um, the sessions that people attended, but then also do these evaluation feedback uh, requests right after the session. So we get the feedback immediately and it can lead to a call to action. Like you really enjoyed that, that discussion with Matthew, would you like to meet with him, schedule a meeting here? So it's driving active behavior in a way that in the live event, you know, I'm, I'm not in control of that as much. And then just the last thing I'd say on content is, you know, obviously we want to be able to analyze you know, not just how many people attended a session, but rather how engaged was it? So how many questions were asked? What was the feedback on the speaker? Um, what follow-up topics did people request? Was there a round table that was um, scheduled afterwards because there was so much debate and lively discussion? Um, what are the opportunities for the speaker to continue to engage in the within the platform experience to be um, an ambassador of of con communication and connectivity and keep that ongoing. Um, so it's very powerful, you know, and the, and the content is a tool to help drive all of that engagement. Uh, thanks, Nerissa. Uh, Jessica, I'd love to hear your um, thoughts on how you were able to track the engagement between your attendees and the speakers and sessions, what information you were able to report on and, and how that um, affected your business decisions. Yeah, well, um, Swapcar gives you a, a breadth of statistics, right? So, um, and of course, our our brands, our exhibitors wanted every single detail on there. Um, so deciding which reports to give them, because as part of their packages, um, several of them were able to get their, their session data. Um, we would just, you know, kind of clean it up for GDPR and terms and conditions. Um, so Give, being able to give them their comments and ratings and registration report, as well as a report that told them who attended the session and how long they attended it, that kind of gives them a full picture of what happened uh, during that session. Like, why did some people register and not see it again? Um, one of the things I noticed was if we sent out a notification about a session, so if everyone, you know, this session is starting soon, that was instantly one of our top 20 sessions of the event. So just being able to see that one little piece of data like, oh, we just advertised one spec more and instantly they get a couple hundred more uh, views or um, registrations on that. So, and then on the, on the NAM side, like on our side, we had, um, well, I should probably say we had over a thousand pieces of content. Um, so we definitely uh, went very big for our first time. And, you know, so the majority of that was brand content. So it could be like product previews, demonstrations, uh, artist interviews. 
um, that side. And then we have our education and training, which is anything from like music and wellness to, you know, marketing for your retail store. Um, so lots of different things, but being able to see, you know, what people liked and, you know, how successful wellness was, um, which I know is kind of more popular for virtual events because you can do yoga sessions virtually. And then sometimes in person, you just don't have space for that, right? Like there's nowhere to put a yoga session and have enough people access it. So it's just interesting to see those, those specific insights of like what we probably wouldn't be able to put at a show, but how successful it was online. And then in addition to that, looking at the numbers from the week of, and then instantly seeing the weekend when the, the, you know, the event was essentially over, the huge increase in session views, right? So there's that initial frenzy and then people are like, oh, well, I have more time now so I can watch these sessions. And since we gave them a whole month after the show to do it, um, those numbers just keep increasing. And then exhibitors will get an updated report of all those that were able to watch their session during and after the event. So I think, you know, they'll be able to glean what they want out of the reports, but I definitely think there's so much value and information there um, that you probably wouldn't get at a live event unless you were, like Narissa said, scanning people inside the door, how long their eyes were open and when they left, you know? <laughs> so, so definitely, you know, virtual, you get, you get deeper, deeper insights. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And maybe a bit of a sidetrack, but um, you, you mentioned yoga. Were there any other types of sessions that you were able to run virtually that maybe you, you hadn't done in, in person for, for any particular reason? I mean, I think like the way that the, the artist interviews, like we definitely had more access to artists because it was virtual. Um, we tend to run up kind of close to the Grammys. So sometimes we can't get the musical artists because, you know, they've got other, other obligations. So, you know, we were able to get Garth Brooks, Melissa Etheridge, like we had those marquee um, artists. And then some of our brands were able to bring in like a performance from John Mayer. And I don't think, you know, that would have worked in our environment, you know, even for security reasons, right? Like there are pop-ups of, of that at our show, but not usually on the schedule, <laughs> it just kind of happens. So I think, you know, the, the access is a lot different online. You can probably get more um, people to do uh, shorter interviews because they can do it from anywhere in the world um, and not have to fly to, to our show to do it. So I definitely think we probably had more access. Um, we were able to kind of um, experiment with some sessions that we wouldn't normally have at the show. We added more education partners, which um, we love to do, and they kind of do their own program alongside with our program. So um, we're able to add like uh, more entertainment stage technology sessions, uh, which just kind of growing our portfolio of offerings. Um, we also had a music and social justice track which did really well. And again, would those sessions have gotten that same attendance at the show when there's so much product to look at and you only have four days to do it? I don't think so. I think that everyone kind of benefited from the uh, longer access. Yeah, and it, it's kind of interesting. Um, we actually ran our, our own event for our clients called Evolve uh, last month. And we were able to attract a couple, you know, really big name speakers that we would not necessarily have been able to bring to an in-person event. So I've definitely experienced that that same thing. So Narissa, you know, obviously I, I love that, that you're using our platform uh, to manage your community. I was curious if you explored the idea of using existing social networks like, you know, LinkedIn or Facebook or, or Twitter to keep your community together um, and, and why you chose not to do that. Yeah, it's a good question. And, and I think Really, the answer is what's easiest for our customer, right? How do we create um, a seamless and frictionless an experience as we possibly can? And so that starts with the beginning of the user journey, which for most is registration through to the to the experience itself, however that um, presents itself. And so the registration and the data that we collect from that 
is really important to inform markets as well as to driving the point in time virtual event experience. So all of those attributes around the customer and the demographics and then the profiling that follows it um, once they're in the platform, you know, that's the richness of information that is proprietary to us as an organization that we utilize um, our power is in our data, right? Our power is in our customer insights and the information we have on them. So I think that that is very rich. And I've heard many times how good and rich the swap card API is. Um, so I will say that from many different people. Um, and so that's very encouraging that we can get so deep into um, user interactions and it continues to improve, right? There's always a roadmap of how that's improving. And, and I think that working with the swap card team has been really easy to communicate what's important to us. And I would imagine it's important to most clients as well. So there's probably not too much um, friction there. And so, you know, there's a good sense of partnership to bring these um, elements on customer data and insights and data coming back to us and continuing to enrich that and, and give us more. Um, it feeds into that API very nicely as a continuous improvement. So that for us is very powerful. And, you know, with Facebook, we have no control over customer data. Right? We get nothing back from them. That's the reality. Okay. Yeah. Th thank you, Nar Narissa. So yeah, Jessica, same, same question for you. You know, you chose to use, you know, the swap card virtual platform. Did you consider uh, maybe expanding your, your traditional social network platforms to manage your communities? And, and why did you choose not to, not to focus on that? Yeah, when we were researching um, platforms, and I would say we we probably looked at about 25 um, and got down to the top top five list. And I mean, what we were looking for was something that had the balance that we needed. Um, we have a, a very high need for brands and exhibitors to be able to show their products. At the same time, we need people to be able to network and attend events. And then we also have a huge educational component. So tell me somewhere else where that happens with the balance that Swapcard has. You know, it's basically like its own social site and you don't have all the extra noise or you're not really limited because a lot of the other platforms we looked at were strong in one area, but very weak in another. And um, I think one of the things that works about social media is being able to see yourself as well. And I feel like the minute someone gets on swap card, they can see themselves inside of that, you know, that world. Um, so I don't, see why taking them out of that would would be a good idea. I mean, we do kind of, you know, we did kind of miss some of the marketing and promotions of using social media to then bring people in to a particular session or something like that. Like that would be um, good to connect those in the future. But, you know, I believe like once you send people outside of swap card, like you're kind of, how do you get them then to come back? Like why not offer them everything they need inside one platform and kind of, you know, keep them around and communicating with each other. Cause that's just gonna, you know, build, build the event up. Yeah. And certainly uh, gating your content, making sure, you know, only, only your group can see it. And some content is of course free, some is paid. So it's, that's a really good model. Uh, so Narissa, uh, for my, my final question for you, I was wondering what surprising things happened when you when you shifted your events online? Well, I would say internally um, with regards to, you know, our operating model, we were in a frenzy, right? We, um, you think an event organizer would just transition from one type of event to another very seamlessly, but it's actually a lot more challenging than you think. So organizationally, um, that has been, you know, a journey we've been on. We've gotten much better in terms of how we organize our, our community within informal markets and the ways that we work. So operational efficiencies, um, upskilling our employees and team members, really changing the dynamics of how different parts of our very matrix organization work together to come together to create an experience that works for our customers, right? That's really at the heart of what we're trying to do. And, you know, it's a continuing journey for us. We're, we're by no means um, there yet, but we're getting better. And putting the customer at the center has been really important in whether it's virtual events, you know, now we're figuring out hybrid events 
and what that means and actually what is best for the customer. So that can be different by portfolio, it can be different by brand, um, it can be, you know, what is the easiest from, um, from a unification. So whether that journey starts with content and ends in swap card or whether that journey starts from an event registration form and ends in swap card or whether it starts from a Facebook post and ends in swap card. Like, you know, even if all journeys end or come to uh, the platform, how do we make it easy for the customer? And that is still a work in progress. And, you know, swap card acquisition of, of Olio is a really critical component in that because that is thinking in that in that framework, right, of what is best and simplest for the customer experience, right? And how do we make it frictionless? So that as one example is, is how we think about the user journey too, both on the buyer and the seller. And, and the last thing I'll say is for us, making sure that our exhibitors have the richest profiles and actually attendees too, so buyers and sellers, have the richest profiles that they can possibly imagine um, and understand why they should invest the time in that and really think about the questions that we ask and that Swap Card asks and not just choose any selection to be done because that's what drives the power of connections, of networking, of content recommendations, but also of lead generation, right, which is really what our buyers and sellers are here for. So we're showing through data and insights and performance that the richer your profiles and whether we help that augmentation manually or whether we're encouraging sponsors to do more, but I will say a lot of the time it's us through customer success fulfilling that, we're able to show that there's actually an increase in you know, product downloads, in meetings created, in meetings attended, um, that ultimately, you know, they lead to sales. So you can actually data point that, which I think is very rich. And then for us as an organization, getting more and more of that data and insight back to, to ourselves so that we can use it to drive um, more engaging solutions and having more insights into our customer. I mean, that's the secret sauce. Uh, thanks, Narissa. So, yeah, Jessica, maybe you could you could add to that. What what things surprised you when you shift your shifted your uh, in person event to an online event? Yeah, I mean, unlike uh, Narissa, this was we just did one, right? <laughs> so we did one, one really big one, though. <laughs> yeah, one really really uh, big big event. Uh, but um, I mean, so everything was kind of surprising. I mean, I worked in professional development, and then the next month, I'm the platform platform manager, right? So um, it was just all of it was how fast can we learn and how can we get people to, like Narissa was saying, adapt within the company. So kind of building that virtual uh, virtual group within the company, because we also didn't, um, other than the studio part, we didn't really use um, a video production team, which all of my research said, and then you hire a team. So um, <laughs> our staff, you know, we took our, our operations department and they really hung in there. They were relabeling, you know, video file names so that they would connect to our AWS. And, you know, all of these things were just, it's like, okay, and now we, uh, we also have to do this. And this is how the videos are going to run. And this is how we have to treat speakers differently. So it's not that it was a surprise. It was just an extreme, you know, like learning experience. Um, one of the other major surprises, I think, was we had a lot of people in our company that were really concerned about chat. Um, you know, we have FTC stuff to follow. We have a code of conduct and, you know, musicians, you know, <laughs> like a lot of people were a little bit worried about what people might say and, um, you know, just kind of like went with our gut and we're like, yeah, it's a positive event. I don't think it's going to be a problem, but um, our director of IT set up a sentiment analysis uh, using Amazon it's like magical and it would just send us an email if anything seemed negative or neutral or mentioned a certain thing and I mean the entire event and we you know like 60,000 users right and um, we only had to I think remove less than 10 comments. Wow. And, we, and we removed two people from the site. One was like heckling, you know, exhibitors in their sessions. So, you know, <laughs> slightly removed that person. But I mean, it was just so much positivity. And I think part of it is like people love, 
you know, our show, but they also love to get together and they love community, right? And I don't think they want to, to wreck that. So we really didn't have to police. Our group chats were beautiful. We had one on like, why do you believe in music? And, you know, anytime I was having a rough hour, I would just go in there and read it. And, and it's just so, so a happy surprise to know that everyone was just so positive and so, you know, willing to, to join up. And again, we didn't really have to police it, uh, which with our staff, we were kind of concerned and having it open 24 hours. So I think that was probably the, the happiest, happiest surprise. And um, yeah, and there's probably more surprises in the, in the future, but, um, you know, again, we were really looking for something that had that balance and so when the numbers and the stats came back and we literally saw, well, like the events were watched, the brands were looked at and the networking was done. We were like, great. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. You know, as uh, as someone who's planned a lot of events uh, over my career, I know how stressful it can be. I mean, there's nothing more stressful than being an event planner. And so having having that discussion where you can go in and see why your audience really cares about your topic. Uh, that's that's super smart. I love that. I'm going to actually recommend that to my other clients. So thanks for sharing. And I think on that on that happy note, let's uh, end it here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Jessica and Narissa for joining us today. For those of you in the audience, definitely um, you know continue to ask some questions in the live discussion. We'll be answering those um, via chat. Uh, so we will try and get to all of those questions. If you'd like to connect. Um, with our panelists today or with myself, feel free to tap on our um, on our bios and you can connect with us on social networks and we hope you enjoy the rest of this virtual event. Mm -hmm.